Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you an exciting dramatization of an unforgettable story on the Hallmark Playhouse. Tonight's story was chosen from the world of fiction by one of the world's best-known authors. Hallmark is proud to present the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we have a story by Rupert Hughes called The Old Nest. Mr. Hughes is a veteran American author who lives and writes here in Hollywood and I recall being much impressed by his workroom when I visited his home. I should think it contains one of the largest private libraries in America, and it was a room to be worked in, not to be tidied up too much. In fact, a stranger might have considered it the untidiest writer's room he'd ever seen, until he looked at mine. But you know, if you're a professional author and you have something to write about, it doesn't much matter what your surroundings are, you just go on writing all the time and on all kinds of subjects. Mr. Hicks, for instance, has put in a lifetime at the writing game, and his achievements vary from popular magazine stories and novels to his realistic and equally popular biography of George Washington. Some years ago, Mr. Hughes wrote the story which we present on the air tonight, and I suspect he was in a sentimental mood when he wrote it. This is by way of warning, or should I say promising you in advance, that the old nest is a sentimental story. And if you agree with me that today is not exactly a sentimental moment in world history, perhaps the contrast will be provocative. Now, before we begin, Frank Goss has a message from the people who, be who bring you these stories. There are hallmark cards for every memorable occasion in your calendar, for birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, there is a hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying name on the back, Hallmark. Well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Rupert Hughes, The Old Nest on the Hallmark Playhouse. It was incredible. It seemed only a night or two ago that Emily had been a drowsy little thing falling asleep in the middle of her prayers. Only yesterday, but today, a moment ago in fact, that same little Emily had called to her father as the train pulled out. Goodbye, Daddy. Tell Mom I'll be home just as soon as ever I can. I will. And take care of yourself. Give the other doctors in town a chance. I will. Goodbye. 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 But you, Father? Yeah, I'm back. See Emily off on the train, all right? I saw her off, all right. Did she cry? No, should she? Oh, of course not. I, I was just asking. Maybe she should have. Oh, for heaven's sake, Father, she just went off to visit her sister in New York. Is that a crying matter? I hope she writes. She's only going to be gone two weeks. Well, the others hardly ever write. Oh, well, they're busy. Jim, Tom, Kate. Now, Emily... Well, you can't keep them babies forever, much as you'd like to. I never said I'd like to. All right. Me, then. What's the matter with the dining room? It looks larger. I took the last leaf out of the table. The table's small again. Like 40 years ago. I'm Stephen. Why? Oh, I'm Emily's sister. She never mentioned you to me, did she? Well, I don't know. I met Emily at... Kate! Emily, darling! <laughs> Hi, Emily. Kate and Stephen. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Emily, how are you? 
You look wonderful. Oh, she is wonderful. How are you, Kate? How are Harry and the children? All to the good. But look at you. Am I on straight? You've grown up. Well, I should certainly hope so. Oh, oh dear, Kate. My sister, Mr. Stephen McLeod. How do you do? We met at the Yale Cornell football game last year. Who won? Yeah. Cornell. <laughs> <laughs> Emily won. I'm a con goose, and that's gospel. Look. Why don't I take you gals to the taxi stand before the rush begins? A good scheme. Onward and upward, Stephen McClaude. Don't you think Stephen is very charming, Kate? I can't take my eyes off the man. Oh, how's Brother Tom? Well, Tom is... Do you think he'll like Stephen? Tom will fairly idolize Stephen. And I seldom see him. I just... Congratulate him on the phone when he's won another big case. He's a hard man to see. Oh, but I'm his sister. I want to see him. He promised faithfully to be over tonight. How does he look? Tired, worried. And now he's going to worry because Mother and Dad will be alone in Carthage. But I'm going home in two weeks. Why don't you marry someone back in Carthage so you could run in on the old folks now and then? Who's getting married? I'm going to be a spinster. Well, I just thought... <laughs> That's Tom now. <laughs> Tom, I want to talk to you about Emily. Problems? I shouldn't be surprised if Emily gets married one of these days. Married? Little Emily? Well, she's taken with a football fan named McLeod. Really? McLeod. I do wish she'd marry someone in Carthage. Well, do you think it'll be hard on Mother and Dad? Well, Emily is the youngest. Well, you may be right, Kate. Matter of fact, the folks have been out of my mind for some time now. Oh, I think they understand how busy you are. I must telephone them one of these days. <laughs> Speak of the telephone. I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello. Yes, she's here. I'll call her. Oh, Emily! Yes, Katie? Lock and bar. <laughs> It's lovely in Central Park, isn't it, Stephen? Except it's so blame central, everybody goes through it. <laughs> who mans the men of war when the men who man them go walking in the park one day? Radar. Ah, oh, science is certainly wonderful. Science and Emily Anthem. <laughs> All else is drab and commonplace. The way I feel is there isn't a drab and commonplace in the world. <laughs> that is the irresponsible sentiment of a woman perhaps in love. Am I right? That's like calling up a girl and asking, what are you doing tonight? If she says, nothing, why? She's admitting she hasn't a date, of course. And if she hasn't a date, the boy wonders if he should date her. Correct. Whereas he should make the girl an offer and see what happens. Worst she can do is say, no, I'm sorry, but I'm dining tonight with an orangutan. <laughs> Don't let me catch you running around with those lower apes. Then make me an offer. I am making you an offer. You, you are? What are you doing for the rest of your life? Well, nothing. Just waiting around for life to begin. Who's calling, please? Oh, Katie, did I tell you? Stephen's company is sending him to Paris to open a European branch. A bon voyage. Thank you, Kate. What are you thanking me for? I'm going with him. Paris? In Paris with a stranger? Oh, oh you... we'll get acquainted. We're married. Married? <laughs> Why, that's the most selfish and considerate act I ever heard of. Why? What about mother and father? What about them? Are you going to leave them all alone? Kate, mother and father have each other. I admit they'll miss us, but I think they'd rather miss us than have us miss life. Emily, listen to me. I love him, Kate. I'll write the folks a letter at least before you go. Let them know what's happening. Oh, I won't have time. I... I'll send them a telegram. A telegram? I haven't the time. They'll understand. <laughs> Married? That's what the telegram says, Mother. My little Emily married? She isn't little. She's the baby. Well, she'll probably be very happy. 
I just hope she doesn't stop at two grandchildren for us. You'd think there were ceilings. <laughs> It'll just be queer, no one around here cluttering the place up. <laughs> After 40 years of cluttering, yes. It'll be quiet. We'll come back now and then. Do you think so? Why not? Oh, they're so terribly busy. Those children just work too hard. They're modern, Mother. They share the modern illusion that money buys everything. Well, it don't. Uh, doesn't. I'm right now trying to think what it doesn't buy. Just give me time. It doesn't buy a lot of things. It doesn't buy the success my children have. No, contrary-wise, their success buys the money. It doesn't buy the happiness we've had out of our children. Don't forget they've frequently been a swift pain. I don't remember. You don't remember, huh? You don't remember the gory pulps that used to come home from school fistfights? You don't remember Tommy falling off the roof? I thought he'd never stop bouncing. The first thing Tommy said when he got conscious again was... Mama, I'm hurt so bad this time, I think I ought to have a dollar. Tom always was a keen lad for the coin of the Republic. Well, I better be on my rounds. Baby's still being born, the same as usual. If I'm not home prompt at dinner, get yourself something to eat. Same as usual. I'm on the late shift at the nursery. Someone's got to sit with the children when their mothers have to make a living. Oh. Suppose I was a widow with young children. I would be enjoying a nice rest. <laughs> Take care of yourself, Mother. Time. The clock changes things. The clock made a big lawyer out of a little Tommy and a busy New York lady out of Kate and Jim, a famous doctor, and now Emily, a bride. The clock sends them away. Maybe it'll bring them back time to time. Time to time. For an hour, Mother Amplin sat, resting against the coming rigors of babysitting on a production basis at the nursery. The great clock whirred and struck again, probably for better hours. Mother Amplin listened after the clock stopped, and before rising from her chair to her somehow pleasant duties. How still it was in the great old house. How still. Listening to The Old Nest by Rupert Hughes, a story selected for you by James Hilton on the Hallmark Playhouse. In just a few moments, we'll return to the second act of tonight's story. You know, if you've seen pictures of old New Orleans, or if you've been there, you've probably seen those magnificent wrought iron grills, fences, gates, and balconies. This is a story of a man who made some of them in a little shop he toiled with his son, a bright lad of whom the father was very proud, for the boy was quick to pick up the tricks of the trade. He designed beautiful patterns, wove them out of metal, twisted and forged iron into things of beauty. But one thing puzzled him. Why is it, he asked his father, that although I copy everything you do, my work never quite looks like yours when it's finished? The kindly old man replied, It will, my son, when you learn to put in it something of yourself, something of the person who will use it. Perhaps this simple philosophy explains why Hallmark cards always seem to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. For people who make Hallmark cards have put into them something of the understanding, some of the warmth and friendliness of personal feelings. It's no wonder Hallmark cards are chosen with such pride, received with such pleasure. You can be sure that your friends will get an extra measure of happiness when they turn the card over, as you did, and discover the name Hallmark. The name that tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. 
Now, James Hilton continues with the second act of the story he's chosen for tonight, The Old Nest. the capital of France is situated on three islands and on the banks of the Seine. It is popularly famous as the breeding ground of women's styles, classically famous for its culture and civilization, and is inhabited by Frenchmen, tourists, bureaucrats, and the fiercely predatory Paris taxi, or great wheeled honker. Paris is admired by young lovers for its boulevards, its promenades in the dusk, and its sidewalk cafes where one can sit and write postal cards back home to Trenton, Ashtabula, Sork Center, or Carthage, USA. Dear Mother and Dad, isn't this a lovely view of the Place de Toile? Love, Emily and Stephen. Dear Mother and Dad, this is the Arch of Triumph from the movie of the same name. Love, Emily and Stephen. Isn't this quaint? We're lunching on the sidewalk, love, E and S. <laughs> Maybe crane, but it doesn't sound sanitary. Paris, that's a long walk from Carthage. I think we can write Emily off for a long time to come, Mother. Well, it doesn't take such a long time to come in an airplane, does it? I have never come across a woman who could take a man's words and twist them like you do. <laughs> well... Never! Twist, turn, distort, and misinterpret... Hello, Dr. Anthon's residence. Who? Jimmy boy. Jim. How are you, son? It's good to hear your voice oh, again. Where is he? Where is he? Do tell, young Dr. Anthon, do tell. Medical convention in Chicago, big man. She's right here at my elbow. Oh. Uh, she's sitting on my shoulder like the organ grinder's partner. I'll let you talk oh, to her. Give it to me. You're holding it the wrong way. Oh, oh. Yeah. hello, son. Oh, it's good to hear from you. Yes, 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 fine. Oh, we're fine, Jim. How are the children? What kind of a near doctor are you? They got earaches. Let me talk to him. Jimmy, since you're so close to Carthage, could you maybe drop down for... Really, Jim? Oh, that'll be so nice. Let me talk to him again. How long can you stay, son? Oh, wonderful. I'll tell father. All right. Oh, and son... How about warm olive oil in their ears? No, no, no. Let me talk to him. I'll tell him, Jimmy. Goodbye. Wait a second. Now, he, he's terribly busy, Father. He rang off. But he's coming to visit us day after tomorrow. Isn't that grand? Honest? Isn't it grand? <sighs> we'll put the leaf back in the table. Won't we, Father? Won't we? Jim isn't coming after all. Oh, Father. That's the way it is when you're a doctor, Mother. How are the children's earaches? Oh, you know, I clean forgot to ask. Well, it's fine. Our son is such a big specialist. Everybody needs him. Yeah, it's fine. I'll just take the leaf out of the table. Time being... <gasps> Mother, what's the matter? You know something, Father? I... I feel kind of funny. Dear Tommy, I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to write you for a long time, son. But I guess I'm one of these modern high-octane mothers. That's what father says. <laughs> Anyhow, the reason... Yes, Miss Ames. Washington calling. Lafarge? Oh, Lord. Uh, look, uh, call Kimberly in New Haven. Buzz me when you get him. Uh, put Lafarge on. Lafarge! Uh, look, Roger, I just haven't been able to get a commitment out of Kimberly, but I'm going to talk to him in a second. He doesn't want to defend. He's... Uh, can you hold it, Roger, please? Uh, yes, Miss Ames. Oh, good, good. Put him on. Uh, hold it, Roger. I've got Kimberly in New Haven. Hello, hello, Kimberly. Anton. Yes, I've got Roger Lafarge holding the line in Washington. Maybe we can get this set up right away. Uh, go ahead. And 
that's how it happened that Tom, busy man, put his mother's letter away in his coat, even as you and I, until one day he put his hand in his pocket and brought forth the neglected letter, his letter from home. Holy cat! Mom's letter. Uh, anyhow, the reason I didn't write was I've... I've been in bed. Mother's been ill. Nothing serious, son, and no excuse for not writing you. Being in bed and away from my nursery work gave me a chance to think about my children once more. How you all used to overrun the house, falling on your heads, breaking things up. It made me look forward to whenever you get a chance to visit us sometime. Tell Kate hello and kiss the children for me. And do ask her to drop a card if she thinks father... Miss Ames, call my sister Kate and tell her I'm coming right over. I would have words with her. Kate, I think it's a crying shame how we neglect mother and father, and we're all to blame. Tom, no one's to blame. You're busy. Jim's rushed off his feet. His children's sick. Ours getting over sick. Well, as soon as this Pycroft case is settled, I... I'm going to visit Mom and Dad. You've been saying that for ten years. Well, this time I mean it. You always mean it, Tom. And if you get a chance, you might even stop in and see us sometime, Big Shot. Really, I'd like to, but there's something very big in the wind. Well, tell me. Well, I, I can't. I, I'm just keeping my fingers crossed, that's all. Kimberly in New Haven is close to the White House, and he likes the way... Oh, no. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. All right for you, Tommy Anthony. I'll tell Ma. <laughs> Wouldn't it be fine, Kate? Wouldn't it be nice if we could run to Mother with our problems again? Wouldn't it be wonderful? Mother! Mother, where are you? Ma! What's the matter, Father? You look frantic. Look at the Chicago paper. Have you seen the Chicago paper yet? Look at the paper. Look at that picture. One guess. It's Tommy. That's our boy. What's he done? He's made the Supreme Court. Listen, President appoints young New Yorker to vacancy on Supreme Bench. Right there, black and white. My son on the Supreme Court. Well, he's my son, too. I bet it's all over town now. Dr. Anton's residence. Hello, Bob. Yeah, yeah. Great news. We just saw it in the... Uh, we, uh... <clears throat> Of course, we knew about it two weeks ago. We didn't either. Yes, yes. Tommy told us to uh, keep it under our hats, which, of course, we did. Which, of course, we yes. did. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Bye. We didn't either know about it. We didn't even get a letter. Mother, is it right that strangers should get news like that about our son before we do ourselves? Yeah. Is it... Be on my side now for once for a change. Maybe he did write and the letter got lost. The letter got lost. Maybe... Uh... Never got written. It never got written. Father... Father, it's the night bell. Huh? Night bell. Some patient, probably. Oh, what time is it? Four in the morning. All right, all right. Put your robe and slippers on. All right. Oh. Well, what in the world? Mother! Tommy! It was Tommy downstairs. Mother, I... I had to come and tell you all about it. I had to be the first before someone else got to you. Uh, have you had the radio on? No, son, no. Anyone tell you anything? About what, Tommy? Then I'm on time. Mom, I'm an associate justice of the Supreme Court. No. Tommy? My Tommy? I didn't dare write you about it until I was sure of it. And then when it happened, I wrote a dozen telegrams and tore them all up. Finally, I said... Good Lord, this is something I gotta tell her myself. Her? What about me? Well, both of you. I just made the last train and ran all the way from the station. Did I surprise you, Mom, huh? I did, didn't I, huh? Didn't I? Most wonderful surprise I ever had, Tommy. Yeah, there's gonna be a reception for me in Washington, and the whole family's got to come. Oh, I... 
I couldn't go. I, I've nothing to wear. Oh, Mother. And another thing, I'm going to get all the children back here afterwards for a big reunion. Oh. Every last one of them. <laughs> I'm the judge. I could have them arrested. Oh, no. You're getting silly now, son. <laughs> I know. I'm so tired. I'm not responsible. But I'm happy. Why don't you lie down here a while, Tommy? Yeah. Thanks, Ma. I, I just want to close my eyes, but... Sleep, son. <sighs> School in the morning. Well. School tomorrow. Sleep. You know something, Mother? He is asleep. Poor boy. Poor, tired children. <laughs> the big kid. He wanted to surprise us. It was a surprise. Most wonderful surprise in the world. Having my baby home again. In a moment, James Hilton will return to tell you about next week's story. Meantime, I'd like to remind you that there's nothing like one of those colorful Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe to make a child's eyes light up with joy. There are 16 dolls in all, Little Miss Muffet, Cinderella, Little Boy Blue, and 13 other childhood favorites. Each one wears a hat topped off by a jaunty plume that's a real feather. Each doll stands up by itself, and each one has a clever rhyme story about the doll inside. But well, that's not all. No, indeed. There's also a big, beautiful album to put them in. There are separate pockets in it for Mistress Mary, Peter Piper, Little Bo Peep, and all the rest. And on the cover is a picture of lovely little Luana Patton, star of Walt Disney's Melody Time. The Hallmark dolls are as easy to send as any Hallmark greeting card and cost only 25 cents each. And the big Hallmark doll collector's album, which you'd expect to cost at least a dollar, is also only 25 cents when you buy one or more of the Hallmark dolls. That means you can give some little friend of yours the album with three dolls in it to start a collection for only one dollar. See all 16 of the charming and colorful Hallmark dolls and the beautiful new Hallmark doll collector's album tomorrow at the store where you buy your Hallmark greeting cards. Now here again is James Hilton. Before I tell you about next week, here are the names of our very fine performers tonight. Jane Morgan, Earl Ross, Bill Johnstone, Gloria Blundell, Sharon Douglas, and Tony Barrett. Next Thursday on the Hallmark Playhouse, we turn back to the early pages of our country's history, the time when our pioneers were pushing inland against the hardships and dangers of the wilderness. Our choice is Drums Along the Mohawk by Walter D. Edmonds, well known to every lover of stirring fiction. Mr. Edmonds takes us to the beautiful Mohawk Valley as it was in that fabled month of that fabled year, July 1776. And his story combines sound history, dramatic adventure, and the love of two courageous people. The author mixes these ingredients with a skilled hand, and I think you will thoroughly enjoy the result. And the following week, we dramatize a fine modern American novel, which has just about everything you'd expect from its title, State Fair by Phil Stong. So when Thursday comes around, be sure you're listening to the Hallmark Playhouse. It's a pretty good habit. And until then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger. Our music was arranged and conducted by Lynn Murray. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Now, this is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Drums Along the Mohawk. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.